appreciate them. Um, we're in First Thessalonians chapter five. where Paul has been dealing with the second coming. In the first three verses, he tells them, basically, the time's uncertain. We don't know when he's going to come. And if that's the case, then verses 4 through 11, the need for watchfulness on their part. Uh, and he describes them as being not in darkness, that that day, the day that he's talking about there is that second coming of Christ, should overtake them as a thief because that's the way in which he has described the coming of the Lord, that it will be as a thief in the night, a time in which, in which people do not expect him to come. So in verse 5, he tells them, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So we're not living like those in the world who do not live in view of the second coming of Christ. The Christian lives with a knowledge that Christ will come and that he might come at any time. And thus we live according to the principles that are found within God's Word. They are not children of the night who do not know about and do not, in a great extent, care about the second coming. The King James uh, does not include a word uh, which others do, and it's the word for. Uh, for ye are all the children of light and the children of darkness. Which makes a little bit more sense in the context in which he's going through. Uh, you brethren, verse 4, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. For ye are all children of light. Another day. I say other translations do include the, the four there. But if you look at that word all, you are all the children of light. Ellingworth and Nida state that the all is emphatic. Uh, that's where the emphasis goes. For you are all the children of light. Uh, people who, and they go on to say, people who belong to the light, who belong to the day, translates a Greek text which is literally, some of light you are, and sons of day. They are sons of light. They are sons of the day. A Christian is a child of light. Light in its perfect sense and perfect usage represents God. James 1 and verse 17. Anybody remember what it says? I know Tim does, but every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, cometh down from the Father of lights. He's the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, there's no cloudiness, there's no dark spots. Uh, even in our sun, there's dark, dark spots. There's no dark, dark spots in that sense. Um, there's no variation with him. He is pure, total light. And then in 1 John 1 and verse 5, John emphasizes it also that this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I think it was last week I mentioned uh, that in the Greek uh, one of the ways in which emphasis is given to an idea is to use a double negative. That's what you have here when he says in him is no darkness at all. 
it uses a double negative to emphasize there's absolutely no darkness in God because he is pure total light. Thus, being a child of light, children of light, is going to be a child of God. One who is a child of God. Now, how do we become a child of God? Simply through the new birth process. We are born into a physical family, or we're born into the spiritual family of God. Uh, and thus, that new birth process is by the Word of God teaching us and instructing us what to do. We are baptized into Christ, and through that new birth process, that baptism or in water completes that new birth process in which we now become a child of God. A child of light. Uh, generally, when we see a even uh, babies, I never get this myself. But um, and children, he looks like, or she looks like. <laughs> I mean, I always do that. Everybody, doesn't it? I never do because I, they don't look like anybody else. <laughs> the, but they take on the characteristics of their parents, right? And through time, to a great extent, they start acting like their parents as they grow up we take on the characteristics of God and of light and act like unto God. Um, thus, in verse, 1 John 1 and verse 5, God's light, in verse 7 he goes on, but if we walk in the light. So we're walking that way, we're living that way. Uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew the fifth chapter, remember uh, toward the end of the Beatitudes, <clears throat> See, at the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is it? You're walking in the light. You become likened to God. You have that, those characteristics, those attitudes, that type of a lifestyle. Um, and then in John 8 and verse 12, Jesus said unto them, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, so, as we are born into that family of God, we take on that family resemblance, where we are living, walking, like unto God. Now then, the problem so many times, and with a lot of Christians, is that they become a Christian. They are, go through that new birth process, but then they don't live like what God expects us to live. There should be a sharp distinction between the two. And that sharp distinction is going to be seen in this verse in the next couple of verses. But it mentions your children. Uh, the word children is the Greek word huios. 
There's other Greek words that translated babe uh, or, or small child. Uh, so there's several different words that could be used, but this word huios is an interesting word. Jesus is referred to as the Son of God, right? This means yes? Yeah, okay. It's this Greek word huios here. It's translated children here. Except here in the plural in which Jesus it's singular. He's also referred to as the Son of Man, right? Again, it's this Greek word huios. I don't know of any time in which, in referring to Jesus, it uses any of the other terms that could be used. It is always wheels. Now then, wheels does mean child. It's properly translated, so I'm not trying to get into that, but, but you know there's nuances of words that don't come across many times. Um, and we use words in a certain way, even though it means this, there's the indication of this aspect. Um, Huios is properly translated children, but it also carries with it the idea of taking on or having the character or the quality of whatever it is. Now then, when you're talking about Jesus, he's the son of God. What do we mean by that? Well, sadly, some people come along and say, and even Christians think, since he's the son of God, he's not God himself, or that he descended or came from God. There was a beginning point with him. Well, that's wrong. He was eternal. The reason that that wheels is important, it's saying that he takes on the characteristic of God. He has the characteristic of God. It's not dealing with, like we would think, a parent-child. It's He's got that quality, the attributes. The, the characteristics of God. When we talk about him being the son of man, same thing. He took on the form of a man, has the quality, the characteristics of humanity. Now, and that's in relationship to Jesus. When we get over to this same word here, ye are all children of light and children of the day. He uses that same word, huios, and so we have to take on the characteristics, the qualities of light or of the day. Uh, that is the characteristics of God. Uh, remember what Peter wrote in, I always forget if it's St. Peter or First Peter. Uh, I think St. Peter 1 and verse 4 that um, we are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. We partake of the divine nature. How? Well, we become a child of God, a child of light. So that we are now walking in the light, we have the characteristics of light, and God is light. Uh, <laughs> becoming like my mother, or guys becoming like my dad. Uh, why? Because we grew up in that environment and we start taking on those characteristics. Uh, and as long as the parent is living in an acceptable way with God, that's a good thing. It also indicates the difficulty, maybe, of breaking that chain and start living 
in a different way, which is as God would have, instead of the way in which we might have been brought up. Think of those individuals who are not brought up in Christ. You know, they didn't have Christian parents. Um, lose a lot of family on the way. Uh, absolutely. You've, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You, and remember Paul's statement to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, be imitators or followers of me even as I am of Christ. He's saying, here is Christ. He's showing the nature and character of the Father. Now then, Paul's saying, I'm showing the character and the nature of Christ, and you can follow me as a result. What is that? That's letting your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. Always, that should be our lifestyle before the world that they see Christ in us. Um, Again, Paul's statement in Philippians 1, for, for me to live is Christ. That's what they should see. Uh, that's what the world should see. But also, as a result, we live on a different sphere of life than the non-Christian. There is a, Does anyone not know the difference between light and darkness? <laughs> I mean, it's time that doesn't work is when you have a bunch of windows in. But yeah, go into a room, have all the lights on, turn them off. You'll see the difference, right? Doesn't take long. Turn them back on and see the difference. Now then, that contrast is what you should see between the Christian and the non-Christian. It should be that clear and that distinct. And I say, problem is, many times, it's not. Uh, there's a diagram that goes around every once in a while on Facebook, I know, of trying to show... Uh, the last things and that you have the world here and then you have uh, Hades with the separation and a great gulf that's fixed there and then you have over on the next side uh, heaven and hell with again a great gulf and my only complaint with that is that one that's over at the very first of this world needs to have that great gulf there because there's a great gulf between the Christian and the non-Christian. Or they're supposed to be as far as the way that they live, the way that they act, the way that they think. Everything about them is different. Uh, now then, night and darkness represent ignorance and separation from God and from thus righteousness, it is thus a result, uh, sin. It represents sin. Uh, Colossians 1 and verse 13. Paul mentions, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us in the, into the kingdom of his dear Son. We were in that kingdom of and the power of darkness, of sin. And we've been delivered from that into the kingdom of, of Christ, the church of Christ. Um, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm going to 
pick on the word here peculiar in the King James. If you get newer translations, it won't use that word. Uh, because, and I heard someone just rail on this, because Christians aren't odd. Yes, they are. Absolutely, they are odd from the world. From the world's thinking, from everything in the world. They're oddballs. Now, that, that's not what that word means, actually. It means that we are possessed, that we are the possession of God. If you look at the etymology of the word, if you drew a circle on a, the chalkboard that I don't have up here, you drew a big circle and you put a dot in the middle of the circle or in the circle someplace. And then you drew another circle over on the side of it. That dot is peculiar to that circle. It's not peculiar to this one. That's the idea of the word. It belongs in this one. Now then you have the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. You are a peculiar people. Here's light. Here's God. You belong to him. It's, that's what we are. You don't belong to that kingdom of darkness. Why? Because we've been translated out of it. Now then, we show the praises, the excellencies of God who's called us out of that darkness. In Acts 26 chapter, uh, Paul in rehearsing his conversion says in verse 18 that he was to open, the, open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Turn from the power of darkness to light. That's what the Christians to do. Uh, mention one other passage, Romans 13 and verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Have we as Christians, the question is then, have we as Christians cast off that darkness, the works of darkness, and have we really put on the power of light, the armor of light? Uh, far too many times that's not the case. And the world can see it and tell it. This verse shows us uh, biblical poetry, parallelism. Now st remember this because a few Wednesday nights from now we'll be, maybe a few, more than a few Wednesday nights from now, we'll be talking about biblical poetry and their parallelism. You have both synonymous and antithetic parallelism here. Synonymous means same, word, same ideas being presented using different words. You're all children of light and children of day. What's the difference in that? He just said the same thing, just using different words. That's synonymous parallelism. Same thing with we are not of the night nor of the darkness. What's the difference? There's another difference using synonymous parallelism. But then you get to antithetic parallelism. That is, you say something and then say it in an opposite way in the second line. So, we're all children of light and children of the day. That's the first line. Now then, the opposite of that, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. So that's antithetic parallelism. Because uh, light and dark are antithetic to each other. So we think of uh, p biblical poetry as being those five poetic books of the Old Testament. 
uh, biblical poetry is found all through the scriptures, <laughs> Old and New Testament. Uh, so remember that. There's an interesting change, though, here also. Notice the first word there in verse 5. Ye, or you, ye is plural. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, Old English is that they made the distinction between singular you and plural you. When we use the word you, you don't know if I'm talking about singular or plural. It's the same word. Old English, they change it from you to ye when they wanted plural. <laughs> Yeah, unless you use y'all uh, like uh, southern folks uh, uses. Uh, uh. Well, why the change from you, plural, to notice we are not the, of the night and not nor the darkness. You are ye, children of light and of the day, but. Now then, we, embracing himself and those who are with him, are not of the night nor of the darkness. Interesting change. Raymond Kelsey explains it this way. Ye are, the writers had said in the negative declaration now, the positive declaration, a transition is made to we are. By saying you are all the writers of the, uh, are likely intended, intending in the Thessalonian church that they regard all the uh, the members, even those whom they feel compelled to rebuke, being of light and of the day. So when he says you, he's talking about all of them, even those that he's rebuking. He goes on, this assurance would be an encouraging, would be as encouraging, especially to the faint hearted. It is also likely that the writers include themselves along with the Thessalonians in the negative statement as a means of encouragement. The change from you to we on the part of the writers also indicates great tact. For they are getting ready to do some teaching on matters of practical Christian living. And they do not wish to do this as a group standing aloof from the leaders and making demands on them. Rather they from, uh, from a wish, to, they wish to include themselves in the brotherhood of the Thessalonians and as standing in need of these teachings also. They want it to be clear, clearly seen that they include themselves in the exhortations. They show that uh, they recognize their own need for c consistency and growth as well as the need for the, th uh, the Thessalonians. In other words, he's going to start giving admonitions. The first, you are all with children of light, to include all of the Thessalonians and not even those that need rebuking. As we'll see in the second letter, they, there are several who need rebuking, even to the point of withdrawing fellowship. But he's including all of them. But now then, when it gets to we, we are children of the night, or not of the night, nor of the darkness. He's now going to start giving admonitions. Notice, just quickly, uh, therefore, let us not sleep. An admonition not to sleep. And he's including that we, those individuals who were with Paul, Paul himself, as well as the Thessalonians, don't need to sleep. Let us watch and be sober. Um, verse 8, let us, who are the day, be sober, and so forth. And so he starts using the us, and thus verse 5, we are not of the night, nor of the darkness. 
in order to put himself that we need those exhortations just as much as you do, Thessalonians. Just a, a subtle change in the pronouns uh, that become apparently very important to them and in his writing. Verse 6 then, Therefore let us not be sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Since we are children of light, we are not to sleep or be morally indifferent as so many are. But instead, we are to watch and be sober. Sleep, if you go back into chapter 4 and verses 13 through 15, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, where it says, But I will not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, they saw not even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain uh, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The three times that it's used there, it's a different word. It's not the same word as what he uses here, let us not sleep. There, obviously, it has reference, using being used in a metaphorical way, of those who have died, from a physical standpoint. Obviously, he doesn't want to have that implication at this point in time, so he uses a different word. Um, even though it is being used, again, metaphorically here, uh, Vine says and defines it a carnal indifference to spiritual things on the part of believers. Uh, and then he continues to say a condition of insensibility to divine things involving conformity to the world. So let us not sleep. What? Be indifferent to spiritual matters, especially on the part of believers. Spiritual matters are that which is of utmost importance. Sometimes we treat them as of lesser importance. But they are the utmost important in our life. What, well, Jesus' question, what shall a man gain, uh, profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I mean, that's, when you're talking about spiritual matters, you're talking about the eternal destiny that we're going to have. And it's either going to be in heaven or in the eternal torment of hell. Now that's pretty important. It should be the main importance within our life. Because what if we, as Jesus said, gain the whole world? have everything at our disposal in this world. But we spend eternity in hell, in torment. What difference will it make? What profit will we have? None. What is it? Let us not sleep. The world is indifferent to spiritual matters. That's not the way the Christian is supposed to be. They live that they could care less about spiritual matters. Christian's supposed to have spiritual matters the priority of his life. The very first thing. Remember Jesus' statement in Matthew 6, 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, what were these things that he's talking about? Necess even the necessities of life. Why you put on your food, your clothing. Uh, so even above those things, you put God first. And God will give you those things of which you need. Uh, <laughs> I 
appreciate that. I know it won't help. <laughs> but uh, Also, uh, he uses present tense. And if you have your cheat sheet, what does present tense indicate? Continuous action. Let us not present tense sleep. What is that? That is, you are not to continue to sleep. Uh, we cannot be indifferent to the way in which we live. At any point in time, we should never be that way. Uh, when he says, be, let us watch and be sober, those are also present tense. So let us not sleep, continuous action. Let us continue to watch, continue to be sober. As do others. Who are the others? Those in the world. Specifically here, those who do not live in light of the second coming. Now, yes, that's those in the world, but uh, just within the context, he's talking about the second coming. And we as Christians live in view of the second coming as opposed to others who don't. And that's the others. They don't live that way. Um, it would be the, the same type of uh, wording as in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13. Um, where... But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which sleep, that you sorrow not, as others who have no hope. Those who are not living in light of the second coming have no hope. Those who live in light of the second coming, they have hope. So again, he's presenting a strong contrast between the Christian and the person of the world, others. Um, uh, let me turn this on and go back to chapter 4 and verse 13. Make it, get it to connect. Uh, No, that is a let's see, perfect tense that concerning them which are asleep. That's perfect tense. Uh, they sorrow not. That would be present tense. Sorrow, even as others which have have is present tense. But uh, the asleep there would be perfect. No, look at your cheat sheet. Perfect. Tense is what? No, that's present tense. Perfect tense is completed action with continuing results. Um, <laughs> they died and they remain in that state is the idea of, in that sense, of perfect tense. Um, uh, Well, there. Instead, we are to be watch. We are to watch and be sober. Watch is from a word which means to be aroused from sleep or to watch, but it's being used metaphorically as 
in this, or in the sense of being vigilant as opposed to being indifferent. We are to be vigilant, watchful, always on guard, as opposed to being indifferent. We see the same type of usage uh, in uh, Matthew the uh, 24th chapter and would add in Matthew 24 this is dealing with the second coming again and he says in verse 20, Matthew 24 42 watch therefore for you know neither the day nor hour your Lord doth come so there's a second coming aspect again and why do you, you watch because you don't know that's what Paul is teaching here in Matthew 25 still in that same general context of the second coming in verse 13 again watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh uh, and then if you skip down a few verses in Matthew 25 to verse 41 then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? Because they were not watching. They were not prepared. Uh, in, in Luke uh, chapter 21, verse 36, it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch. Be on guard at all times. Uh, mention to others in Acts 20, verse 31. You remember um, last Wednesday night as we were going through Brother Gallagher's class, he brought up Acts 20th chapter where Paul is uh, going on his way back to Jerusalem. When to get there in time for the Passover, he decides not to go to Ephesus. He stays at Miletus and uh, calls the elders, and they come over, and he tells them, therefore, or tells them, um, starting in verse 28, uh, and my mind just went blank on verse 28, because I just... Take heed unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, verse 31 is a verse I wanted to get to. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Look at all this, he says. You take heed to the flock, take heed to yourselves. There's going to be men rising, speaking perverse things. Even of your own selves, there's going to be people drawing people away from Christ. Therefore, watch. Constantly being on guard. One other passage, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, or act like men, be manly, in other words, and be strong. And the next verse starts with, do all things with charity. Five ad ad great admonitions that uh, Paul gives there, but the very first one, watch. Uh, we will have to stop there this week and begin in at that point, Lord willing, next week.